Hello, everyone. Uh, it's nice to have you again at the Mycetoma Research Club. And today, uh, Prof. Lemia Al Hassan will be joining us, on, and she will be presenting on histopathology of mycetoma. Uh, Prof. Lemia is a uh, is a professor of pathology, and Prof. Lemia, the floor is yours. Okay, thank uh, you, Dr. Uh, Samira. Before before you start, I would like to congratulate and. Uh, uh, Professor Limia for being part of this uh, group. Professor Limia, she is a professor of pathology at a lot of prestigious position in Sudan. And now she is in Saudi Arabia. She was the dean of the medical school at Ahfad University, one of the prestigious medical school in Sudan. Uh, I would like to to thank her for being part of this highly and a motivated group of young researchers, and we hope you can do a lot of work together in the future, uh, Limia. Thank you very much. Please, the floor is for you. Thank you, Professor Fahal, for your kind words. And actually, it's really enjoyable to be part of such a dynamic group. Uh, it's uh, We look forward to every Tuesday, actually. It's the highlight of the week. Um, so thank you very much. OK, hello, everyone. It's great to be with you today. Uh, my talk is uh, about the histopathology of mycetoma, but uh, with emphasis mainly on Madurella mycetomatis. And uh, maybe in future sessions, we can talk about the other types. Um, so no need to introduce myself. Uh, I was introduced uh, by the Prof. Fahal and Dr. Samira, so thank you. Okay. This is why I don't like this, because I'm trying to shift the slides and they're not um, they're not moving. So, Dr. Samira, if you, I'll stop sharing and if you can share it from your side. Okay, just give me a couple of minutes. Yes, sorry. So I'm, I'm trying to open it. I'm trying to open sure. the presentation. Okay, I'm sorry for that. It's totally fine. It's totally fine. Thank you. So shall I stop sharing then? Uh, hold on, I'm trying to open it from my side. Okay. It's uh, it's moving now. Okay. 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 You can keep on. You can keep on presenting. And if it stopped, I would then. Okay. Sure. Start sure. From our okay. Side. okay. Okay. Just for the time constraints. Okay. Sorry, everyone. So, uh, this is this is what I will be talking about: the histopathological diagnosis, the histopathology, and like I said, I will uh, emphasize. Uh, I will, I will mainly concentrate on material mycetomatis, the host reaction and uh, a bit of special stains, and uh, lastly, electron microscopy. So regarding the histopathological diagnosis, uh, there are some advantages, of course. Uh, it does not need aseptic procedure or a fixed time schedule. However, of course, a disadvantage is that it lacks precision of culture. Uh, and also it needs a deep surgical biopsy. And I think this was mentioned in one of the sessions uh, by Professor Fahal that we cannot do a punch biopsy. It needs to be a deep surgical biopsy. And this actually might enhance spread of the uh, organism. And uh, surgical biopsies usually are done under either general or spinal uh, anesthesia. But uh, regarding true cut biopsies, these, these are done usually under local anesthesia. And the biopsy actually is divided into two parts. One is placed in a sterile container with normal saline for grain sculpture. And the other part, of course, should be fixed in 10% formalin, formaldehyde, for histopathological examination. And then it, it will be processed accordingly. Uh, mycetoma is a chronic granulomatous subcutaneous infection, as we all know. It's either caused by actinomycetes or by true fungi, which is the eumycetoma. 
And clinically, the disease is characterized by swelling, deformity, uh, and sinuses in the affected part. And the diagnostic triad, of course, is the swelling as is seen in this photo and in, in the previous photo. There are uh, multiple sinuses and uh, the discharge containing the grains. And of course, in Madurella mycetomatis, we all know that the grains are black. And actually, this is mentioned by the patients because it looks like uh, black cumin seeds, which I think are called nigella. Um, this photo, this is a sinus track, okay? Now this is the skin and this is the sinus. And as you can see, the sinus track is discharging the black grains of Madirella mycetomatis. Uh, this is uh, also a gross specimen of the foot and leg. And uh, it's seen here that the uh, mycetoma is involving the foot and the lower third of the leg. And in this longitudinal section, the black fungal grains are spreading. You can see them, they are spreading uh, in the tissues, including the bones also. What about the spread of mycetoma? Um, actually, mycetoma may spread like a malignant tumor. It can either spread locally or lymphatics, but rarely through the blood vessels. Uh, in, the, in this photo, which is depicted, there is spread of uh, mycetoma or M. mycetomatis from the foot to the, this is, these are the inguinal lymph nodes. And uh, this is a cut section of an enlarged inguinal lymph node. And uh, as you can see, uh, the black grains of M. mycetomatis can be uh, clearly seen. Now, of course, the grains vary in color, size, and consistency, depending on the causative agent. And this actually will help in making a tentative diagnosis. But a definitive identification of the agent, of course, is established by the histological examination of the grains by culture or by other techniques. Regarding Madurella mycetomatis, it is the most common cause of EU mycetoma in the Sudan. And in clinical material, the grains in the tissue are black and numerous. And like I said, this is the black human seeds or nigella. And patients usually come saying that it's like the uh, uh, black human seeds, which in Arabic is called the kamun al aswad uh, What about, what do they look like under the microscope? Now in stained sections and by stained sections, we mean the routine hematoxylin and eucin stain. The grain of M. mycetomatis is either rounded, oval, or trilobed. And um, I don't know if you can see the pointer, but uh, it has a more, this is the cortex, the outer part, and this is the medulla. And these grains, the madurell grains, the cortex is more compact. That's why it appears thick, okay? Not only that, but it's also dark brown in color due to pigment which is produced by the organism. And if you can look at the inner uh, side, the medulla, it is lighter, okay? Now these grains or the filaments are usually embedded in a brown hard cement matrix. There are two types of grain, filamentous and vesicular. Um, this is a section of a filamentous type of grain of M. mycetomatis. And like we said, these hyphae are embedded in a cement substance containing a brown pigment. So this is the filamentous type. What about the other type, the vesicular type? This is a vesicular type of, uh, of a grain of M. mycetomatis. And uh, I want you to concentrate at the periphery. The hyphae are mainly located in the periphery and they are swollen. And that's where the term vesicular came. Okay, so if you look at the periphery, the hyphae are swollen. That's why they called it vesicular. Um, there's a very interesting phenomenon which is called the splendor Hopley phenomenon. Uh, also, at the surface of the grain, you can notice this pink color. 
okay, which is eosinophilic. Uh, this is a fibrin-like material covering the grain, and it is actually of host origin. It contains fibrin, immunoglobul immunoglobulins, and complement. And this is what is meant by the splendor Hockley phenomenon. Okay. So this pink color on the surface of the grain uh, is what I'm uh, alluding to. Occasionally, uh, on the opposite side, there is uh, another layer, but this time this it's blue. So we call it hemato hematoxophilic. Uh, this granular material uh, is found also on the surface of the grain and it is fuel gene positive. Now, uh, fuel gene stains the DNA. And so why is it positive in this case? It is derived from the nuclei of the disintegrating inflammatory cells, okay? So the inflammatory cells, they disintegrate and the nuclei contains DNA. And this is where the positivity comes from. It gives this bluish color. So how is the host reaction classified? It is classified into three main types. Type one, which is a central neutrophils or neutrophilic zone around the grain. Then you have, so the, 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 I, meant, I mean the layer which is immediately uh, adjacent to the grain containing of neutrophils. Then there is a middle a layer or zone that contains the macrophages. And at the periphery, there are lymphocytes and plasma cells. So this is, if you see this, uh, this is a type one reaction. So let's go to type two. Type two, the area or the zone around the grain, which is immediately around the grain, there are macrophages and giant cells. And then you have the lymphocytes, plasma cells in the periphery. So this actually can be explained that initially, there is a local host response, which is characterized by usually a nonspecific inflammatory response and neutrophil chemotaxis occurs. Then it becomes more organized. Uh, so the macrophages migrate to the site of infection and their activities, their microbicidal activities, then they are enhanced by interferon gamma and TNF. Okay? Now type three, which is like the delayed type of hypersensitivity, you have this epithelioid granuloma. And I will show you uh, photos uh, soon. So um, this is neutrophils. This is the grain, okay, which is brownish in color. And like I said, this zone which is adjacent to the grain is composed of neutrophils. So you would characterize this as a type one type of reaction. Uh, the good thing is that neutrophils can be easily seen uh, or picked out because they are multi-lobed and so on by the routine h &E stain. But you can do an, a type of immunohistochemical stain. Uh, it is known that neutrophils are CD15 positive. And so here, the neutrophils are giving this brownish color, okay? So these, this means that they are CD15 positive, which will even uh, um, make sure uh, that these are neutrophils and not anything else, okay? So CD15 positive neutrophils, and like I said, the brown color is the positivity surrounding a grain of M uh, mycetomics. Uh, now, this is a type 1 reaction, but uh, here the tissue is stained for CD68. CD68 is uh, a, a macrophage marker. So here the macrophages are in the middle zone. And th this is what we said in type 1 reaction. You have the neutrophils here, which can be stained by CD15. But in the middle area or zone, there, there are the macrophages, which are CD68 uh, positive. And also there, you can appreciate the brown color. And the peripheral zone, we said it contains of lymphocytes and plasma cells. What about the type two reaction? Uh, so the, the neutrophils become replaced. This is actually a multinucleated giant cell formed from uh, many macrophages fusing together, okay? And you can see here that uh, the grain here, the pigment is there. So, 
this means that this is a type two reaction. Why? Because the uh, cells that are immediately adjacent to the grain are formed of macrophages and giant cells. Uh, lastly, we said there is the type three reaction. This is an epithelioid granuloma, okay? We know that a granuloma is formed of uh, macrophages which fuse together forming giant cells. There are plasma cells, lymphocytes, and at the periphery there is fibrosis, okay? And in this photo, you can see the, in the center there is remnant of uh, pigment. So this is a type three reaction. As I said, uh, it's considered a delayed type of hypersensitivity reaction. And sometimes it's even considered as a spontaneous regression. Um, what happens after you give antifungal treatment? Uh, you, you will see, you will appreciate where the arrows are. This is fibrosis. Okay, so there is a lot of fibrosis. So fibrosis after antifungal treatment is also a feature of uh, m mycetomatis. Okay, coming to immunoglobulins. The presence of uh, the neutrophils when they bind to the grain is seen in the presence of immunoglobulins, which are seen actually on the surface. But the presence of immunoglobulins, whether IgG or IgM, can also be nonspecific, and uh, they can result from their exudation together with other plasma proteins, okay? But here, th this is uh, a stain, also immunohistochemical stain for IgG, immunoglobulin G, which is coating the fungal hyphae, and also uh, CD3. Uh, CD3 also is done here in this uh, by the immunohistochemical staining, and you can see that the CD3 is on the surface of the grain. And actually, this the CD3 is regarding as a chemotactic factor to attract the uh, neutrophils. And like I said, initially, the neutrophils come and then they are replaced by the macrophages and so on. Um, Regarding the deposition of immunoglobulins and the activation of complement, it's actually found that it was on the melanin layer on the surface of the hyphae. Thus, the lysis of hyphae or destruction of hyphae by complement does not appear to destroy the grain. Like I previously said, the complement attracts the neutrophils and then the neutrophils can uh, do the job committing suicide as they destroy the grain by their uh, enzymes and so on, okay? Uh, what about the bone lesions? This is a, a bone sequestrum. This is a dead bone. Uh, and uh, how do we know that it's dead bone? It doesn't have nuclei and it just appears as this pink material. So this is a sequestrum or dead bone. Uh, this is a grain actually, this uh, on the left-hand side is a grain in a cavity within the bone. And this is reactive bone around the grain. Now in the bones, what does M. mycetomatis do? There is usually no capsule formation and the organism usually forms cavities that are filled with grains. And actually this gives the bone support and can explain the rarity of pathological fractures in uh, mycetoma. Okay. What about the vascular changes? Uh, this is actually a vein, and as you can see, the lumen of the vein, the center here is very narrow, okay? And it has thick uh, muscle layers. So uh, what are the sp other special stains that can be done? Okay, like I said, the h and &E is the uh, routine, but you, you, you can do special stains. For example, uh, methanamine silver or gomori methanamine silver. And uh, this actually is highlighting the black color of the fungal hyphae in the left side of the photo in M. mycetomatis. So all this black color is considered positive. So this is by the silver uh, stain. Another stain that can be done is the periodic acid shift, PAS stain which highlights the purple color of the grain. Now melanin. 
What about melanin? Melanin also can be stained by the routine H and E stain. It appears as a black color, but uh, here you can do uh, Masson Fontana. There are several stains for melanin. This is Masson Fontana, and also uh, it appears as this black color. Okay, the high at the periphery of the grain are covered with uh, melanin. Another stain that can be done for melanin is small stain. Uh, this shows cement substance and hyphae staining a blue color. As you can see, you can appreciate the blue color. So this is a, another special stain for melanin. Um, von Costa stain is a special stain for calcium. And also it gives this uh, black color. Uh, so this means that the grain also, uh, in addition to melanin, it also contains calcium. What about electron microscopy? As I said, the, there is cement substance which is surrounding the fungus. And uh, here it can be seen, uh, the growth of hyphae as indicated, if you look closely, there are these curved lines, okay? And the black material in the cement substance and around the hyphae is considered to be melanin. So the area in the middle with these curved lines, this is the hyphae. And this is actually a neutrophil, okay? And as I said, it's multi-lobed, so that's why you see around three, uh, three lobes here. This is a neutrophil where the arrow is. It, ha it has penetrated deep within the grain. And actually, this is another neutrophil, or also the same neutrophil, but adhering to the surface of the grain. And actually, it is depositing granules, okay? So it is discharging these granules into the grain. And the grain has now fragmented as a result of the action of these neutrophils. And uh, we said that the first cells that come into action are the neutrophils, and then after that, they commit suicide, they die in the process. It becomes more organized, they are followed by the macrophages which clear the uh, debris. And with this, I come to the end of my talk. This is actually, these are the references that I used. Uh, the website, of course, is very rich with a lot of resources. Uh, also the standard operating procedures and my late father's uh, uh, presentations and uh, uh, resources about pathology of mycetoma. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I'm open to any comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Lemia, for this nice presentation. <clears throat> uh, indeed, it's a nice presentation, very educational. And there's a lot of important uh, point uh, um, mentioned in this presentation. So now we can easily have a proper diagnosis for mycetoma from these histological uh, slides. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Kimi. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, nobody's answering, nobody's asking questions to be answered. I see there's, uh, we don't have any raised hands, but there are two questions in the chat. Yeah, please. Uh, okay, uh, the first one uh, was, uh, could look if he raise a say be useful in histopathological detection? So this is the first question for Prof. Um, Actually, I don't have an idea about that. I have to look into that, actually. Um, I don't know if, if uh, Professor Tambo can elaborate further. Tambo, if you're here, would you please unmute yourself or you can just uh, write it in, on the chat. And then another question also from Tambo Proflemia saying that any latest Techniques that are less hectic that, that are less hectic for rapid detection. Um, actually, uh, no, we don't usually do this as a routine. 
but this was just for for educational purposes. But uh, we always rely on the uh, on the H and E, especially in in, uh, in uh, low resource uh, areas. Okay, so the H and E by itself can give you the diagnosis right away. You can couple it with a bit of special stains, for example, the silver stain and the PAS. These are very easy to do. Uh, the immunohistochemical stains, of course, you don't actually need to do it, okay? But uh, because it's more expensive. But with the routine H and E stain, so this is the first line, okay? Then you can do special stain, and then if you need, for example, if you want to classify the host reaction, because this is important, of course, in diagnosis, you can then um, you can then uh, do it, okay? But otherwise. Uh, you don't do it. So this, this actually, this was a spectrum of the histopathology, but not necessarily. Uh, we don't actually. We we didn't used to do it in our routine uh, uh, specimens for mycetone. I hope that answered the second question. Limia, uh, can you tell us more about the value of having this uh, tissue reaction examination? Uh, how, they are, okay. how they are useful? I think they're useful. Maybe you're the expert. <laughs> yeah. uh, they are useful in uh, in the in the diagnosis and possibly also the prognosis and maybe management. Uh, like I said, for example, in the type three, it can be regarded as uh, uh, especially if you have the fibrosis with the granuloma. So this is a response to treatment. Or it can be sometimes considered as a spontaneous uh, regression. Yeah. Okay. I have to say that the late Professor Al Hassan, he was the first to uh, describe these three types of tissue reaction in mycetoma. Uh, they are very useful, uh, but we did not find any correlation between the clinical presentation of the patient and the type of tissue reaction. Probably because the number of patients included in that work was not uh, massive. Uh, probably we need to have more uh, special uh, uh, scanning and immunohistochemical test to correlate the clinical presentation of the patient with the type of tissue reaction. But as you mentioned that type three indicate this is indicate this is a, a healing process going on. Well, um, there are some questions in the yeah in the yeah. chat. Uh, uh, Dr. Yeah, Kadim, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kadim is asking, like, have you ever have you compared the histopathology with other techniques, and if if you did, what was the specificity of the histopathology? Uh, okay, thank you for your question. Um, we have compared it, but in the terms of specificity. Uh, I, I can't really give you a, a, an exact figure, but um, like I said, uh, it's it's um, with the routine H and E stain that is fine. Uh, if you do a special stain, this will confirm it even more. If you do immunohistochemical stain, it will be even more specific. But in uh, with uh, regards uh, figures, I can't really uh, give you figures. Um, there's also another question. Uh, uh, oh, there's a comment actually. Yes. Yeah, it's a comment. Yeah. Actually, the last time I I uh, I um, diagnosed the case of my cytoma was uh, almost nine years ago because now I'm in Saudi Arabia and we do not see uh, we don't see cases of my cytoma here, at least in the lab where I'm working. Okay, so if someone has any comment or question. Uh, <clears throat> a pity that we did not uh, see uh, him this this evening in the in the in the chat in the in the meeting because he did a very good work. He used the AI uh, machine learning to diagnose mycetoma by these techniques using histopathological slides. 
again, this is a very good because eventually, we'll, if if you have no um a good pathologist around, and the techniques are not available there, so we can only um have the machine give you the diagnosis for mycetoma in this in this situation. Uh, it the the accuracy was almost ninety six percent. Uh, with this technique, using AI uh, a diagnosis for mycetoma histopathological slides. Definitely, we need histopathologists to have more ideas and a more diagnosis about this. What are the problems with uh, histopathology, uh, uh, Limia? Yes, yeah, Prof. Hmm? What, what are the problems with histopathological diagnosis of mycetoma? Uh, uh, you mean, uh, okay. Um... Yeah. The constraint and channel challenges. Yeah. yeah. The okay. If you start with the fixation of the tissue itself, okay. Yeah. If it's not properly fixed, of course, this is a number one uh, problem. And then in the actual interpretation, and I'm sure you've seen this, the variability uh, when you were in Sudan, maybe the variability of the histopathological reports. Um, second, uh, second thing, if it's not a deep surgical biopsy. Uh, that will also uh, cause a problem. Uh, uh, third, I think the the expert of the of the of the pathologist himself or herself. Um, yeah. And uh, I, this is these are the main. I can't really think of, of anything else. But uh, I'm, I'm very interested in looking at Dr. Hiam's uh, work. I, I I hope that she can present it sometime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Hiam, one of them is she around? Uh, Hiam is not here today. She's a bit busy, but she will be joining us in the upcoming weeks. I think one of the one of the important issues with mycetoma is that histopathology you you send the lab the specimen to some grains there, and then. The result will show that there is no illness of mycetoma in this. Yeah. What is the problem then? Uh, maybe there is fibrosis. There's a lot of fibrosis. Uh, mm -hmm. If the specimen was fixed properly, uh, possible in, and you saw the grains, you mean? You send yeah. the specimen with grains, and then they yeah. tell you there's no mycetoma. Maybe yeah. during processing, the grains yeah. disappeared, but I don't think so because they are uh, they will be deeply uh, deeply embedded. But yeah. if the patient was on treatment and there's a lot of fibrosis, so that can be another thing. Maybe there's a problem in the tissue processing. But yeah, um, yeah. 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 but uh, of course with M mycetomatis it's easier because the black grains are there, so it's quite easier even while you're cutting the specimen. But yeah. maybe with the other types, it's uh, it can be a bit difficult or challenging. Yeah, yeah. I ask that because we we should always have more sections from the specimen, from the from the blocks. We usually sometimes one of the blocks is there is no grains there, or mm -hmm. the grain has been displaced during the process and disappeared yeah. from the from the slide from the from the from the from the slide. So always we need to have more cuts. And ask for more deep uh, 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 processing That's of the true. tissue. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. And usually, sometimes when you do that, but it has to be properly fixed from the start because, um, okay. yeah, because uh, if there's if there's fat, uh, it wouldn't be uh, cut properly. So sometimes you can leave it overnight, actually, and cut oh. it in two and leave it in uh, leave it overnight for proper fixation. That would be better. Uh, yeah. So probably yes, during processing the grains can uh, be dislodged or whatever, because yeah. I think the grains also contain fat, right? Uh, yes. Not really, not really. Uh, I think I read it somewhere. Anyway, mm. uh, because uh, uh, when you come during the clearing phase, it this can dissolve it or something. Mm. 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 Um, there's another question actually. Is easy test away from invasive surgery? Yes, you can do. Uh, Cytology. Yeah. Yeah, you can do cytology. And it's cytology. very easy to do. Yeah. Cytology and tissue block. Has and tissue, yeah, yeah. Tissue, yeah. Yeah. tissue, block. Yeah. tissue block, yes. Yeah, yeah. You can tissue take a cell block. block. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Sorry, the cell block. Cell block, yes. Um, Prof. Lemia, and at, at the beginning of your presentation, uh, I think you said yeah. that uh, histopathology uh, lacks precision. So you mean like it lacks precision about identifying the species or 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 what did what, what did you exactly mean by lacking precision precision in what yeah uh, uh, what i meant is that when you compare it to culture okay because all uh, it's not easy to diagnose different fungi let's say if you're talking about fungi uh, with the routine stain Okay, so sometimes this needs a bit of expertise and it entails for you to see uh, a lot. But I, what I meant is it lacks precision uh, when you compare it with culture. This is what I meant. Maybe I should have put it in another way. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, I see another question in the chat, specificity and sensitivity. Of fine needle, uh, maybe Prof. Fahel can uh, can answer that because there is the SOPs on uh, on uh, on the cytology. Uh, Prof, do you know the exact specificity and sensitivity <laughs> of cytology? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Really, I'm, there is a paper on that, but I'm not sure uh, okay. the figure right now. I don't remember the figure right now, but we can share it in the group that we can send you the paper showing the specificity and sensitivity of the different techniques. Yes. Comparing the histology and the cytology as well as the culture at this. Yes. I think it's 90 something, but I'm not really yeah. sure. So we yeah. need to I'm look it sure. yeah, yeah, and, and, and uh, give you an answer. Yeah. I think definitely the, the histology is important in low resource countries or yes. situation or centers because you don't need to have a lot of uh, uh, sterile, sterile conditions and uh, uh, easy can be done. It may take some time to process the, the, the specimen and to report on this, but definitely it is much better than the culture because the culture has a lot of problems. You have the contamination. Yes. The contamination, it has to take about two to three weeks to have a, a growth and then to identify the growth. And that may be confused with different type of organisms. Yes. Um, it, it is here to stay the histopathology, but definitely we have a room for the molecular diagnosis of mycetoma. And now we have the sequencing uh, procedures to the identify the microorganisms. Uh, I remember we sent some slides, uh, some culture to UK uh, for sequencing and for molecular diagnosis and identification. And we send with the report, histopathological report on this. And then after a few weeks, they told us there is some confusion and mismatching of the of the uh, of the of the of the slide of the of the isolate and the report of the slide. I said no, this is the problem that with the histopathology cannot have a very detailed diagnosis to the species level. And that is why it was a confusion at that at that level. But with the sequencing, the easy have identification of the organism to the species level. Yes. Okay. Um, Prof, uh, do you mean that um, if if for example, if we have a suspected mycetoma case and there is a possibility of, of running all of these tools in parallel, like the molecular techniques as well as the histopathology. So mm. do you recommend that they run in parallel to confirm, to better confirm the diagnosis? Yeah, if, if that is available, it will be very good to have very accurate diagnosis, especially if you want good for a research purpose. <clears throat> but if you want to do it for, because even now we can have a, a black grain human stone, and then the histology will tell you this is Madrella mycetomitis, and in fact, it is another organism, and the response to treatment will be different at this site. This is state. So if you can have more detailed diagnostic tools to be used, it is better because you can be in a good position to say that this is organism, this is organism X, and this diet treatment is this for, for this, this patient. The more accurate the diagnosis, the more accurate uh, advice about the treatment of these patients. 
Okay. Yeah. Karima, are you around? Um, Kadima, I think Kadima is not here today. Yeah. No. Because he can tell us about the types of uh, the common organism in, in Somalia, in, 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 in Senegal. Uh, I think he left. Maybe he's having a okay. network issue because he yeah. was around just a yeah. couple of minutes ago. In Saudi Arabia, uh, in Saudi Arabia, Limia, what are the common organisms there? Um, I have no idea actually. Mm. Uh, in the in the lab where I'm working, actually, uh, the histopathology has just started, or actually, it just launched. So yeah. uh, I, we weren't seeing. But in the the previous lab where I was working here also, uh, yeah. I never saw a, a case of. Uh, of my setoma, although I, I expect it to be uh, here in the southern part of Saudi Arabia. But uh, yeah. I, I I need to to look into this, but uh, I never encountered it during my practice. Yeah, this is very interesting because in southern part of Saudi Arabia, yeah. very close to Yemen, it's an endemic area for my setoma. Yes. And mm -hmm. commonly it is the actinotype type of my setoma there. Okay. Probably they go to other lab or other hospitals. probably probably yeah. now there's a big regional uh, lab actually this mm -hmm. only started uh, like a, a year ago or something so maybe they're seeing the cases there but now in the university hospital of course it's very yeah. limited yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and Yemen of course is 90 kilometers from Jazan so oh yeah. yes it's only very 90 close. Kilometers. very close yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. indeed <laughs> So, like the regional lab that 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 was established, is it like for mycetoma or it's no, 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 for, it's for it's everything. a general for everything it's for everything. Actually, it caters for a very big area here, and so uh, they're seeing all sorts of things, and not only histopathology. There, there's also hematology and other microbiology and so on. It's a very big lab. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Actually, we saw some cases from, from Saudi Arabia came to the center in Khartoum. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are Saudi and some of them are Yemeni living in Saudi Arabia. And uh, again, a mixed, mixed uh, organism there. We have Madurella, we have Sitwan Somaliansi, Naktanu Madura, Maduri. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we have different types of patients coming from Saudi Arabia. Were they located in a specific area or like they came from different parts of Saudi Arabia? Mainly from the south. South, southern, okay. southern part of the Saudi Arabia. The okay. okay. Yeah. Can you tell us why the neutrophils are commonly seen at, in the vicinity of the organism? Uh, because, like I said, it, this is the initial local host response. Mm. Uh, so it's uh, the chemotactic factors, they attract these uh, neutrophils. Uh, and, but these by themselves are considered to be sort of uh, ineffective mm. because the, the grain will still continue to grow and so on. And then the reaction changes from these neutrophils uh, it attracts the um, macrophages and giant cells and so on. So this is the initial local uh, uh, host response. Yeah, but I, I would like to ask about why the initial response is by the neutrophil, not, why not by the plasma cells? Why uh -huh. not by the... By the I think it because it's, it's considered an acute type of inflammation in the beginning, before it becomes chronic. And we know that in the acute type of inflammation, the first cell that comes is the neutrophil. Mm -hmm. Then yeah, as the but, disease becomes more chronic, the yeah. other inflammatory cells uh, come into play. But but still, in the, with the very chronic cases of mycetoma, you see neutrophils very... Yeah, the neutrophils, yes. You can see them. Yeah, they, the, yeah. uh, the, despite the fact that uh, it becomes chronic, but sometimes in chronic inflammation, you can see a mixture of... A, it's considered a chronic active type of inflammation. So you okay. see the chronic inflammatory cells plus the neutrophils. 
Again, again, with actinomycetoma, you see abundance of these neutrophils. More with than actino, with because it's yeah. a bacteria. So uh, uh, you no. expect to see the neutrophils uh, increase in number with bacteria. With the bacterial infection. Yes. Okay. okay. It's very interesting now. Yes, mm. it is actually. Yes. Uh, and I, and I, I think I think the important thing at this stage it is not <clears throat> identify the organ, the, the the type of cells, but we know it, we we need to know the function of these cells specifically, yes. so mm -hmm. we can de decide what can we do in the future as a treatment for this patient. Yes, exactly. That's true. Yeah, because if you're going to do any any, any immunological modulation or uh, whatever. We need to know exactly what's happening in the tissue itself at that time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What well, other uh, other uh, other material secreted by the tissues or by the organism is very important mm -hmm. to be identified. Yes. So people they can either enhance or reduce the function of that substance. <clears throat> That's true. Yes. Because as you know, in mycetoma it is a battle between mm -hmm. the organism and the and the immune history <clears throat> and and the, and the tissue reaction. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the currency is due to uh, uh, this, 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 uh, this reaction is going on. Yeah. So really, we need to go in depth and know what is happening in the tissues. That's true, and it's very yeah. easy to follow them, actually. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I feel that there are some gray areas still not mm. really uh, understood with regards of, because this complex interplay of the pathogen and the host and the environmental factors. So there are still things, I mean, for example, why isn't there vascular uh, spread or it's rare? Why mm. is it more with the lymphatic? There are so many questions that are, and why why is this melanin being produced? Is it re really melanin? Yes, it's proved by the special stains, but why, why is it, uh, is it used as a protective uh, response on behalf of the organism? There are so many things that need to be further looked into. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think what we see and what we know it is the and this is the anatomy of the of the pathology actually, but we need to know the physiology of the pathology itself. Yeah. yeah. We need to know the material produced and how they act with each other. And uh, monoclonal antibodies studies, a lot of things can be done in this area. Yes, that's true. <clears throat> so, any, 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 mm -hmm. any further question from the group? Nema, any question? Yes, Prof, I have a question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my yeah. question is: uh, Is that we able to use a, a technique like a flow cytometry uh, to detect the the CD marker in the tissue tissue from uh, my stoma patient? Um, I think you can do that, but it's uh, it would be rather costly uh, if you can. I don't think you need to do flow cytometry, but I, it can be done. But if there is another cheaper way to do it by yeah. these special okay. stains because yeah, yeah, you're looking for the neutrophil CD15, you're looking for CD68, and you can, yeah. if you want to know the type of lymphocytes, for example, if it's uh, T lymphocytes or B lymphocytes, maybe you can do, but you don't need to do even that. You can do CD3, CD8, easier yeah. by immunohistochemical, but that, that's actually a good point. Mm. Okay. So we cannot detect, uh, uh, like, uh, use uh, specific antibodies. I think it's, uh, uh, as uh, Professor Fahal said that, uh, uh, it is no plasma cell. Plasma mm -hmm. cell use ant uh, antibodies. So yes. what is the problem? What, what's the problem is no, uh, it is no binding between antibody and uh, the molecule of the organism. Is there is no epitopes or what's the problem? Uh, you mean regarding the immunoglobulins? Yeah, yeah. They are regarded actually as being non-specific, and actually uh, they uh, they were found mainly on the surface of the melanin. Okay, so and okay. Uh, like I said, they're regarded as being non-specific and resulting from uh, exudation actually, together with the plasma proteins. 
but they're not really that specific. Okay. Uh, like uh, I said, I this mean, is also another gray area that needs yeah. to be looked into. Uh, mm -hmm. Limia, the, the Hobley phenomena, you see it mm -hmm. in the my stone. Yeah. Uh, I know it is a miracle uh, process. Yeah. What is the value of this? Um, actually, I don't think it's uh, of real value because it can be seen in mm. many fungal, uh, parasitic, and bacterial uh, bacterial uh, uh, yeah infections. It's mm. just composed of fibrin and immunoglobulin. So maybe maybe it's just the composition, but it's not really that uh, specific. Mm. And I don't know if it affects the treatment or the prognosis or not. Mm. It will be very good if you can have uh, uh, um, identifying this phenomena before treatment, and then to give the treatment and yes, then what, maybe. what will happen to what will happen to this. Yes. Will it increase or decrease? Decrease it, exactly. It decrease, yep. yeah. And if the patient is not responding, what will be the, what will be the fate of this? If responding, what will be the fate of this phenomena? Uh, can that be an indicator of uh, indicator for or, or predictor for cure in the future? So, yep. Well, so you see, we came with many many postulations I today that I think they can be looked into. Do, do you think it is possible from histopathology to say uh, this patient is having a regression or well, he has uh, has a uh, uh, what do you call it, a uh, spontaneous cure or or yes. healing process. Mm. Yep. If you see a lot of fibrosis and uh, no remnant of grain or only a bit of uh, or partial uh, uh, fragments of grain, you can say that uh, there is spontaneous regression, especially if you compare with uh, before treatment and after treatment. So it's mm. if it's only composed of fibrous tissue after, you can say that there is spontaneous regression. And I don't know actually uh, if you you have seen um, uh, regarding histopathology, if it was mentioned before, yeah, Prof, if there is spontaneous regression or not. Yeah, clinically we saw some cases <clears throat> with okay. spontaneous regression, but not healing. Because regression, that means that the mass start to decrease in size, mm -hmm. more fibrotic. But yep. if you do surgery, you will find the grains there. Uh -huh. So it is, it is not it is not a spontaneous cure. It is just a spontaneous regression, regression. in the size of the yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know what will happen after that if the patient has problems with the immune system or yeah. he develops some immuno immunosuppressive uh, process <clears throat> that will flare up again. I'm not sure of this. Yes. Okay. Uh, the problem, problem is yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Of course. Go ahead, Dr. Samir. Okay, I have a question. Just. Uh... Complete what you were saying, and then I could yep. go. With no, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. No, no, no. It's all okay. right. Go ahead. Um, regarding the three types of the tissue reaction that you've you've mentioned, and mm -hmm. can they be a clue for the severity of the disease? For example, like will one of them be present just in only in 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 early cases, or so does it has a relation with the severity of the disease? Um, actually, you can see, uh, and I actually forgot to say at this point, is that you can see the three types of reactions in, in the same tissue. So okay. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, maybe it's an indication of what the, the host uh, is reacting to this, okay? So if you have, for example, the granuloma, this is a delayed type of hypersensitivity uh, reaction. So um, if it can be taken as a severity of the disease, um, it can be. But the problem is when you have this mixed picture. And sometimes, actually, it's very difficult to, especially if the grain was fragmented, to see the immediate zone. But it's not, it, it's not impossible. And we used to do it, actually. Uh, all our reports used to contain, um, uh, mention the type of reaction. But like I said, you can see the three types. It's also variable from one person to another and also variable from one organism to another. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question, uh, Limia, about? Yes. Is the granuloma the advantage or the advantage for the patient with mycetone? 
actually it is an advantage because mm. uh, yeah it's regarded sometimes as this spontaneous regression mm. Mm. yeah and uh, uh, but when you have a lot of fibrosis around it this can also be explained by the by the reaction of the uh, uh, of the uh, host to the treatment okay but uh, the granuloma can be seen as a good sign but the problem, the main problem with granuloma it is what will be the effect of the granuloma or on the on the diffusion of the anti antifungal drugs. Yes, this is the problem because uh, yeah, especially yeah, with yeah. the fibrosis around it. Yeah, 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 because that will in, definitely will. I don't know, but may hinder the diffusion of the antifungal yes. through the tissues to the to kill the organism which is there. Yes, so yes. I so it is. I don't think it is advantage or disadvantage to have the granuloma, but definitely <clears throat> it is not advised to have something which can re, uh, destroy the granuloma. Yeah. The important thing about the granuloma, again, it is with medical treatment, the granuloma will form and that will help surgeon to remove this mass completely. Yes. <clears throat> so, we, really, we don't know <clears throat> is advantage or disadvantage the granuloma for the mycetoma patients. Even in the fibrosis, early granulomas usually don't have a lot of fibrosis, but maybe the late ones, the late, the older granulomas have a lot of fibrosis. Fibrosis and around actually, the... Yeah, mm. and actually uh, the, this is the, uh, it can be looked into the, the, for example, the interleukins and the tumor necrosis factor and so on. This mm. can be as, uh, actually if the type 3 reaction was proven, maybe another drug can can uh, can be uh, used to treat these granulomas specifically. Well, I, because I, we know that for a granuloma to form, you need these uh, interleukins and TNF and yeah. so on. Yeah. I think there's a work to be done at the level of the tissues, at the level of the granuloma, and to see exactly what is happening there and how can we utilize the knowledge and get from there to treat my histoma patients. Yes. By either, increase, by either increase the granuloma or uh, increase the diffusion of the drug through the granuloma to the tissues, to the organism. Yeah. Yes. I think there's there's a need for, for new drugs that, that can, can diffuse through these granulomas that have yes. the ability to diffuse within the granuloma. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Okay. Very so, interesting, very educational session. And we're five minutes post our time. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Shukran. Rimea, thank you very much for this elegant presentation. A thank nice you. presentation. You're welcome. It will be posted at the Mycetoma Research Center website. Excellent. Very okay. good. We're looking thank forward you very for much. more. We're looking forward for more sessions on the other types of uh, mycetoma histopathological diagnosis. Inshallah. We'll Shalla. do this, Inshallah. Shukran, Shukran, Thank you very much. Shukran, Yazeera. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. And until we meet again next week. Thank you. Shukran. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.